Okay, well, good evening, everyone. You want to finish on time, don't you? So we'll absolutely do that, even if you have to stop me in mid-word. I will do it. Let's just have a bit of a talk about teaching in other cultures. Can we have people just write notes on the board as we go? A bit of a track of it. So what do we mean by other cultures? Are we absolutely talking about someone who lives in another country, language and religion, or are there are other ways of being in other cultures? Okay. Yeah. So there are a huge number of other cultures, and we tailor our cloth to fit the culture. What sorts of cultures do we have in Australia? Please talk to the. Alcoholics. Yep. Alcoholic. Children. Children are a special culture. Yeah. What else? Tradie culture. Oh, and they're wonderful. Wonderful. Can't beat them. PDC for tradies and your whole bioregion's transformed. Okay, what else? The incarcerated? Yep, prisoners, except they don't like permaculture in prisons because they end up making booze. Ask for pots and make booze. Um, okay, what else? Some more cultures? White Australian privilege? Yeah, WAP, all the WAPs. That's most of us. Uh, what else? Gender diverse. Gender diverse. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Nations. Yes, okay, good one. Religious cultures, and often they're quite distinct, aren't they? Even different types of Buddhism, different types of Islam, Shia and Sunni, different types of Christianity have, an, have a culture as well. Many of them are developing what they call eco-spirituality and would be very interested in permaculture. Okay. Mm, permaculture is a subculture. We should teach them a lot more than we are. There's quite a difference between like rural, town and city culture. Yeah. And then there's the burbs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So there is. Yeah, absolutely right. The, uh, the so-called, you know, the wealthy elite. And they are a special culture and people are tapping into them through teaching permaculture in business schools at universities, such as Monash and others. So it's not enough, but it's starting to happen. Okay. Sports. Oh, oh that leaves me. We could have a lot more permaculture in the sports world. Don't think it exists there. Mm-hmm. Okay, is that enough? And when we look outside Australia, what are some of the cultures that you might run into? Uh, countries. Yeah. Let's think about it. In terms of sociology, we've got the collective cultures where people talk about we instead of I. So that's so much of Southeast Asia and also the Middle East. And some of their values are different from ours. So what we call nepotism is a culture to employ your family and look after your family. Not well understood, and in a way it is nepotism. It's not what we try to use as meritocracy. So we've got individual, individualistic cultures as well. Capitalist, like, mm. that makes a big difference to sort of... The 1%. I don't know how you get to them. You have to buy a ticket to the moon and go with them in a capsule. Mm. Mm. Well, I was sort of thinking as well, like in a country like even Australia or America, where yeah. there's more of that capitalist sort of system, there's more Right, that's exactly right. Cap that sort of capitalist thing. systems and socialist systems. Mm. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Oh, okay. That's right. Mm. 
Mm, and they're very different because the socialist systems have a different attitude towards education very often. And there are those that are highly bureaucratic and those that are less bureaucratic, and that does make a difference. So do you think we've listed enough for the moment? What else would you like to? Okay, so I'd love to produce a course for the um, shepherds of the world, which people forget still exist. So all through Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran, Mongolia. Africa, Mongolia, there are shepherds with sh and they would be like citizen scientists with phones recording, sending back, talking about the difference between this year and last year, the weather, the climate changes, the species, the food supplies. So how we reach them, I'm not sure, but it's a dream I've got, but I can't see how to do it at the moment. But definitely for, um, for shepherds and others like them. Mm -hmm. Okay, now teach, actually teaching in these cultures, what are some of the things that come to mind? Let's change the colour. And can people at the back read red on white at night? Okay, there's something to learn, isn't it? You can't really read red on white at night under electric light. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, what are some things you need to know about other cultures before you go to teach? Customs. Customs. What sort of customs? Do you need to know customs? Um, I mean, it's probably unrealistic to be able to know all of them, but. Um, Things like whether eye contact is appropriate and whether um, uh, yeah, body contact and um, yeah. gender yeah. Yeah, roles. And so that's critical. The whole thing about gender roles and spacing. So. Cambodian women don't, do not like to shake hands. They are Buddhists, but they do not like to shake hands with men or even with other women. So that's very strong, and they'll be offended if you do it. Now, these are small things that help you, but when you're actually teaching, there are other things we have to look out for as well. Think, if you're not sure, stand behind and wait to be shown what to do. Never sit at a table or any sort of meeting without someone telling you where to sit. Otherwise, you'll take the wrong place and everyone's slightly out. Don't sit at the table and serve yourself. Let someone else do it. So often the youngest person has to serve the rice. And I saw a chap from Tasmania. Well, I saw a chap. It doesn't matter where he came from. And we sat down at the table in Vietnam where you take pieces from a common bowl and put them on your rice and then eat with your chopsticks. He just took two plates and ate them all and the rest of us stared in amazement and the food was gone. So, you know, it's a bit like family staying back. It means when you're not sure, stand back and someone will tell you where to sit, what to eat, what order to eat and more or less how it goes. So you make yourself behind rather than forward because when you're in a forward position, you're likely to blow it. But if you're asked to teach somewhere, what are some things you need to know? Do you have issues um, where it's actually being a woman, like teaching men? Yes, and you do what you do as a teacher. You take time to establish your worth and authority. And it's not authority you do this, it's authority of knowledge and ability to teach. So it might take a little while and people will be restless and then gradually they settle down as it starts coming together. But yes, that, that has often been there, a little bit of... You know, what would they know about it? What does she know about it? A foreign white woman can't know anything. But I don't try to know it either. That's another thing. Yeah. Well, I've led very heavily on having contact in these places. Uh, not so much a mentor, but a, um, a trusted confidant that can accompany me into these situations. So when we're going and working in the schools or whatever, it's who are we going to meet? Where are we going to meet them? What are the protocols? Can I be in the room with the women? Can I do this um, and be guided by them? And, once, and, and they seem to very happily embrace that role of, if you explain to them that you just don't want to offend them. So if we just return a moment to sort of gender roles, and strictly male, female, because in many countries there's denial about any sort of other roles, 
then you might have to consider the seating and how it works. You might have to consider your energizers, they what we call light and livelies. You can't have people touching. You might have two groups and everyone will be comfortable with that. You might have to be careful with eye contact. One of the extreme ones for the row, not the Rohingya, the village beside the Rohingya was the women didn't like to laugh at all or raise their arms or move at all in case the imam or their husbands. That's the most extreme form I have seen of Islam for women, which is to sit quietly and don't be noticed and don't be seen and don't move. But gradually we eroded it by making sure that no one could see into the space. We moved the classroom to a different tree. And then when we, could, we were at a different tree, that we were under that tree, I'd look around and say, well, I can't see from the mosque and someone walking from the path can't see, so we have some privacy here. And the men in that group accepted it. And, but there was just that, you suddenly say, you know, head, shoulders, and they go, head, and you think, what's happening? And you realise, no, that wasn't okay. And, you know, they're all in black pro dress, and sometimes I am too, which is pathetic, but never mind, it happens. Um, and the other thing is I don't criticise the stuff, I just go with it, and usually try to abide by whatever code they've got. Um, but you find that different levels will constrict your teaching and things you want to do in the classroom and out of the classroom and at meals. So there's all that to look out for. So what else would you like to know about? Often it helps to know whether seniority is respected and then you look at where people see themselves and they know the place of importance. They know where to sit. By the way, so do your students. The student who wants your, your attention will actually sit opposite you. The student who doesn't want to notice, be noticed sits on your left because most people don't teach to the left, they teach to the right. As you all did today, you all taught to the right and that was again confirmed. But the students learn to sit here, you won't get asked anything. So up there you can ask your questions and get the attention. Now in all societies, people intuitively know where to sit for where they want to be in the class. And that's all cultures. So you watch it, and what we do, of course, is break up the seating, make everyone sit somewhere different. You know, let's have a quick game, and everyone sit down where you are and start again. And that breaks the thing, and no one realises that you've noticed these patterns of authority developed by seating in space. Mm -hmm. Roy, do you go in first and do some sort of analysis of the context? Okay. Do you go first and do an analysis of the context in to which you're teaching, like the no. landscape context? or? Look, I can't know. You can't go for a few weeks and know anything much about the country. So when you get into content, you can't do their content for them. You have to lead the process of permaculture through. I'll explain what I mean. Now, if we're doing a kitchen garden and... It's very slow, but you might be working through an interpreter. We want you to get into groups and discuss the 10 easiest to grow vegetables. Then when they do that, how long, what varieties do you know? Because sometimes they've got great lists of tomatoes and great lists of onions, all heritage stuff they need to be looking after. But what are the 10 easiest to grow? Then when do they flower? When do they fruit? When do you harvest? What are the pest management problems? They answer that in their groups. I haven't got a clue. I don't even need it interpreted because I don't need to carry away detailed knowledge of what happens in a Rohingya village. And when you get to perhaps zone four and forest, you say to them, OK, so what trees do you know and what are the products? And two hours later, they're still developing the 986 products that you get from trees. And I'd ask you, Mob, what you get from eucalyptus and you're going to say wood and oil. So you get an awareness of the depth of knowledge and the value of that knowledge. And the other thing I do, are there any songs or dances? So we got an old Rohingya man and he was teaching them, you plant like this and you sing this song. Or there are fishing songs in Bangladesh on how to catch the fish. So there are lots and lots of ways of learning that you constantly ask, how do you do this, what do you do? You don't want someone to tell you those 860 uses because they need it, and you can take that list, get it printed and give it back to them so the knowledge isn't lost, but you have to be able to direct the learning so they cover the material. Mm. And you would then get into 
so your food forest, and you would say, what trees grow well, what fruit, how do you do this? And then say, how do you meet its needs before you plant one for nutrient, energy, water, work, protection and harvesting? How are you going to do that in your environment? And they come up with the appropriate ways. I can't know, and it would be stupid. I'd fall down a hole if I tried. No, I can't. OK, what else would you be thinking about? Sorry? Uh, language. language is critical. Language is everything. So are you teaching with an interpreter or are you teaching in basic English? So along with language is literacy because I usually, one of the questions Sarah said tonight was can, what material should we have translated into Rohingya for you two to teach in the camps when you're there next month? So the Rohingya have very low literacy. So therefore, what materials and what is the content of that so that those who can read can use it for others? Literacy materials are often taken home and used by the children to read for their parents and they're the only materials they've got. So lots and lots of languages. Dari, Pashtu, lots don't have materials in their own language at all. And I don't know how it seems to you, but it seems a terrible injustice. What you can do here is go over and look through that books and verify anything we tell you. You can check it online. But if you don't have the language, you are dependent on someone coming in and telling you and it may be erroneous or exaggerated or inappropriate. So you have to be able to think about language. Um, if possible, you get some things translated in advance. Principles. I've got sets of, sets of principles for the Congo, I've got sets of principles for Sudan, principles in Dari, principles in Pashtu. They go up round the room. We haven't got ours up yet. Oh, are they all up? Oh. oh, lovely. Okay, good. Okay, so you get them up so at least people can be tuning into that. People are not literate. You don't ask because people are often ashamed. They'll often say, my eyesight's not very good. My friend's going to tell me or show me. And what you are asking is for everyone to draw. And the drawings are absolutely whatever they do. So you ask them to draw a picture of their land or village. And it can be lots of things. Um, and then show where things are. The pig might be very big and purple because that's money. And when that pig is killed, it's going to provide for funerals and, and pay debts and all sorts of things. So it's larger. We teach the principles of design methods. So the design methods, of course, are our zoning, our analysis. Um, we use putting things in certain proximity. We use thinking about slope and access, and we use those design methods, which are early in the permaculture books, and then ask people just to do drawings. Oh, I've got the most fabulous naive drawings, perfectly clear. It's nothing to do with architectural drawing or clear black and white. It's all about, tell me about, what, about your palm tree here. Now that palm tree gives us so many nuts and timber and fronds for summer when we stop work because it's too hot in the fields and we make our roofs and walls for the wet season. Right, OK. And what about this? Oh, that's so-and-so. And you find there's clear logic and understanding of design, just that we have to learn to read it. <coughs> Similarly, they couldn't read our black and white. they just look at it and be a mass of stuff. So you give people pencils and you say, Every, you may not be able to write, we don't care, draw. Draw a picture of your house, draw the land, draw the things on it as it is now. Where does the wind come, the rain come, the da 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 you know. The whole thing, it won't look like what you would do, but it will be accurate and perhaps more accurate, more detailed, because people who live outside are making better and closer observations than people who look at screens. So there's all that that you can follow through, and so getting people to draw. Um, the other thing is what drawings people understand. So if you draw a house and then a buffalo at the back, people often think the buffalo is standing on the house roof. And people who have been illiterate and had four years training can revert to illiteracy if they don't have materials. 
and they read drawings differently. You know that first book of mine? Did anyone ever see the cover? It's about windbreaks. And there's a man with a pile of wood and there's, then there's the windbreak and the smoke goes up straight and the cow's fatter and there's more water. I said, what's happening there? And they said, oh, that's a brick kiln and charcoal making factory. So, you know, they are not seeing what you see when you look at a drawing. That's why if you're giving any materials, you get them tested. So in Afghanistan, they do drawings. And then I'd say, go to the marketplace, find 10 people, ask them what they see, come back and tell us. And we'd get the drawings accurate because they would not see what we saw. So when you're drawing on the board, it's, there's a lot of care required with those things. But everyone can draw. So that's, that's sort of one of the things that you can engage people in all the time with that constantly affirming. Good, that looks interesting to me. Nice work. Can you explain this? You know, just affirm, affirm. And at the end, after a couple of days, people are feeling they can do this. And of course, it's a boost. If you've always thought a pencil was a magic thing that made black and white marks, suddenly you can make a representation of your life. So it's important. <sighs> What next? Oh, that's a lot. Phew. So let's talk a little bit about if you're teaching in English. So one of the things to do, this is partly about con any concept should be able to be taught by you to anyone. And literacy is no measure of intellect. I've met people, I thought, what well, Einstein's, the way they grasp stuff like that, second after second after second, and were immediately at home and with you. So being deprived of literacy, which is a vast injustice, is not anything to do with intellect. It's just, just, just inequality and unfairness. It's nothing to do with it. So someone said to me, do you have to sort of talk down to illiterate people. Never talk down to anyone, ever. Well, it's just, I just raised really recently completely on a different tangent to this. In fact, when I was procrastinating from permaculture study, I was reading an article that was talking about how people that are illiterate have just, like, better pattern recognition, and particularly yep. face recognition and face reading and empathy and sort of like those sorts of skills. Yeah, literacy just, and language. spending time looking at words. The, the time mm. is spent reading faces, mm. thinking about people, thinking about scenarios. Yeah, and they often have other languages, more body languages too. Yeah, and so do, body so do prisoners. Prisoners can say and find out who was the visitor who walked into the yard and are they safe, you know, just about three movements. So they have a whole series of language going on below that everyone understands. But just coming back, if you're teaching in English, then you must constantly verify, is this clear? Shall I repeat it? What are some of the really fatal questions? Do you understand? You, you'd be very brave to say no. You stand out against the crowd. So that's reassurance for you. Is that all right? Yes, good, I'll go on. Do you understand? Yes, that's good. Is that clear? Yes. What do I need to say again? What do I need to say more slowly? And this becomes part of your pattern. Can I repeat it? Was I too fast? Take it on yourself. Was I too fast? The other thing is when you're dealing with concepts, many people haven't had your education. So where you'd know a word like evaporation, they may not know. Even in their own language, what it means. So you start to talk about evaporation when water becomes a gas and you know when it comes off the pond or when there's a mist in the morning you give the word, you give a definition, and then you give an example. And you do that with everything that might be difficult. What's condensation? When you're in the bathroom in the morning, this is for us, and water forms on the mirror, it's going from a gas in the air to a liquid, condensation. And it's very important on leaves of trees which can drip at night and add to rainfall. Has anyone seen this? So you've got word, definition, example, all the time. And it links into learning styles so that people who don't, are not particularly listeners, they would like to have it explained in practical terms. So those first dynamic group, they really enjoy that. Others just think, well, that's what I thought. 
you know, so if you're really an abstract thinker, you're confirmed. That's what I thought evaporation was. And then next time you use it, do it again. So we're talking about evaporation from water in dry countries and why we don't need any more open ponds. Hmm? And then evaporation, what's happening? The water becomes a liquid. But if they can't know, like sublimation, when water goes from ice to directly into air without going through a liquid stage, you'd say, does anyone know sublimation? And give them a few seconds and then say, it's when this happens. Don't leave people guessing and feeling they should know. So there's the pace, there's clarity, there's shall I say it again? Shall I repeat it? Shall I slow down? Would you like an example? Because we're helping people learn, that's our role. We're not testing them. None of it's about testing people in any way. We're trying to facilitate learning strongly. So in English, use received ordinary vocabulary. You know, I remember someone said once, duck upstairs, the man went upstairs, came back and said, no ducks upstairs. You know, yeah. And be, we have to be really careful. What was the one, Greta? You were you. Let's wrap up this session. And I remember thinking, no one's got wrap up here. Not in Portugal, even in the English, wrap up doesn't exist. So be careful what is your local language. I have heard that there are four key words that have meanings in many languages. Yes. And that English in particular has lots of words that don't have any equivalent in other languages. Has that been your experience? And is there anywhere a lexicon of words that can be translated yes. in most languages? Yeah, so Dan Palmer's partner, um, hang on, Melissa? Amanda. 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 The moment she gets to a new place, she has a piece of paper in her back pocket and she writes down the 100 most common words. Bang, bang, bang. Boy, girl, person, please, thank you, numbers. And she's got them learnt in two days. And suddenly she's tuned in to what people are saying and she's got them. Words like cow... Uh, field, home, mother, father. Uh, it's another story, but once I got kidnapped in, in Madras at two in the morning and I kept the conversation going nearly all night with a taxi driver with, do you have a brother, brother, mother, father, village, work? I kept going round and round those words, which is the limit of his English, until we were all exhausted, but I stayed in the back seat. But that got me to a relationship that wasn't threatening and eventually to a bus station simply by relying on those key words all the time. And once you've used a new word, explain it again and use it again. So if you're talking about water in your sector analysis, then you come back to domestic water, then you come back to environmental water, then you come back to water and trees and their transactions, water and grey water in your zones and how you use water and ponds. After a while, you will know their words. And especially if you're working with a translator, then you know they're talking about water, they're talking about vegetables, they're talking about animals, they're talking about trees. Even if I can't remember them, I'm able to say no one understood that. Translators say, yes, they did. I say, please ask people what so-and-so is. And that ask, and you're relying on your visual thing all the time for that blankness that comes when people don't get it. But reduce your vocabulary without being patronising, and when you interest a new word. So that's when you're working in English, and Australian accent is particularly difficult, while a really good American accent is real clear. And everyone understands American English very well. I can't do one. Yeah, so the Australian accent, of course, we're known to be able to speak without moving our lips. You can keep your teeth clenched and have a good sentence in Australia. You just don't have to, don't have to open your jaw. You can have a rest while you're talking. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so being careful because some people will also do a little bit of lip reading over time for signs or consonants and things. Okay, so that's one thing. If you're teaching with an interpreter, it's a different thing altogether. 
Usually your interpreter has not done a course in English, they've just picked it up. So they're not a professional interpreter, they certainly haven't done permaculture. Your best bet is to make your best friend in that course your interpreter, because you're having to talk to the interpreter all the time to see whether the class is getting it. So you start the night before and you put up big posters. And you say, okay, tomorrow we're going to talk about global problems. This is what we're doing in English. And this is what we're doing in Dari, or the principles. And you get the key posters of information, much more than timetables, put onto those so that that helps the student. And then you go through the vocabulary making friends all the time. Your interpreter can do a lot of damage if they don't like you. Um, <laughs> or you haven't got a good relationship. But then interpreters, they spend a lot of time on their mobile phone. And you're trying to get something through and the interpreter is looking at their Facebook and that's difficult and you must be very kind and sweet and say, please, would you mind if we come back to the topic? Um, because the interpreter is all important. When I'm working with an interpreter, will you be my interpreter, sure. please? Thank you, if you don't mind standing up. Um, you're often standing, but if not, now, oh, oh, <laughs> would you mind putting that away, please, Ollie, because I'd love to talk to you about it. Like, would you like to step forward a bit? Thank you. And make sure the person with the national language is in the spotlight, because it would be very easy for me as the teacher to put myself there. Oh, um, <laughs> Do you think it's time we have a few minutes rest and you could do your Facebook? Would that be helpful? Good, okay, thanks very much. We'll just take a little rest and you do that. You, will you be right in five minutes? Sure. You sure? Yeah. Good, I trust you. Okay, so, you know, you're working like that all the time with this sort of stuff. With the interpreter, it can be absolutely shocking. So if you've got five languages and five interpreters and you say you want to ask people what they think, it has to go forward and backward and forward and backward, and that will triple your time. So a 12-day course becomes an 18-day course, simply for the time and the fact of interpreting, and people get bored so that you're going to change your teaching methods. Apart from having key words and key things, as Sarah said tonight, what can we get translated into Rohingya in advance? What would be useful? So you arrive and you've got your contour map, you've got your principles, you've got... Um, site visit, you've got soils analysis, water analysis, and all these things done in language in advance and printed if people can read. If they can't read, you resort to a whole series of different teaching methods altogether, and that's another thing. Mm. And that gets really difficult. I wouldn't ever want more than two languages, and if I'm interpreting, into French and Vietnamese, I just get so confused between the content, the responses, the, what people are saying, and bringing it back into the group that I actually can interpret quite fast on one-to-one, -one, but when it's a class, I just lose it. So if you've got another language, you'll better speak directly into that if there's only one other language. Once you get three or four languages, I'd say to people, no, we have to have another course. Three or four languages aren't fair to anyone. Really, they don't work. Mm. Ro, can I offer just a middle ground between a course fully in English and one that's fully translated, which we've had a couple of times, where there may be a few people who don't have really strong English, but they could be sitting next to someone yeah. who does, and so you, you can allow for time for translation for them to catch up, without needing to have the whole course translated mm. entirely. Mm. Or where we just were in Portugal, there was one woman whose English, her understanding was very good actually. Her speaking wasn't as strong, but her partner wrote down in diary as we were teaching everything that was being said. And so she had this live stream mm. um, captions on in the notebook the whole time and, and kept up to date. Yeah. Yeah, and you'd normally put language groups together. So if you're diary speakers and you're Pashto, then you work in your own language and your interpreter tells you what's going on in the groups when you give them a group discover discussion on soils or whatever it is. Then you have to go around and monitor very, very closely to see if people are on, on track there. 
Um, actually, they're pretty hairy courses and probably woefully inadequate, but sometimes that's all people will get in their lives. Mm -hmm. They might end up towing themselves under a truck to go to Paris to earn some money for the family, which is what people do, and somewhere that permaculture is going to be valuable. So delivering the best you possibly can of useful, relevant knowledge is an enormous gift to people in this circumstance and desperately needed and appreciated. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and I just think going back to, I think Stacey, you asked, do you do research about the place that you're teaching? And I think the response at the time was no, but I would posit that we, you have a responsibility oh, yeah. to give people appropriate content mm -hmm. and not just let them know about how to set up an English cottage market garden somewhere where it's completely mm -hmm. irrelevant. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, maybe going back to those strategies rather than specific techniques and, and presenting the strategies and the principles and letting the techniques be um, filled in by people who know the local knowledge. And if you're aware of where you are, you can often talk about things like the tropical fruits and vegetables and what happens and how it goes. So you have that knowledge behind you as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think it fits into maybe a much wider discussion about the decolonisation of permaculture mm. and this idea that people in Australia know best and bring it and sort of bring maybe a, a missionary approach of we're bringing these ideas to to you and your culture rather than acknowledging that sustainable practices have existed in all cultures at some point and it's not that far behind, if, or not behind, but long ago, and that by asking someone where, where their, how their parents grew up or what house their grandmother lived in, what's culturally appropriate is, is not actually coming from white people who've written books about it, but it's coming from and reminding people that the knowledge is there within their cultures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the sorts of questions about Zone Zero would be what houses work well in your climate? Please draw it. Then you might see that you need something else. You need mosquito netting or you need a solar panel or you need something. But people know what has worked well traditionally very often. But mainly circ circumstances are degraded. What we bring is good, but we're not bringing the curriculum for here with, you know, the lemon tree at the door and the circular path and the compost there and the chickens there because it will be set out slightly differently. In Cambodia, we had five metre square gardens because that's all the water. So you always design to your limiting factor. So they designed to the lack of water. So as long as the ponds lasted and how they could get water off the roof, that was the size that was possible. But the rest of it had to be perennial. So you're modifying the details, but you're not modifying your um, principles and techniques. Watching that documentary about your work in Afghanistan, it seemed like a lot of the time it was just trying to provide basic needs for people, you know, in a survival situation. What was the process of setting up a call? Did you did you go there intending on doing a permaculture course, or was it kind of like just working with the, the change? I've always been invited, Charlie. I'm always invited in by someone. I might say to someone, you're interested in having a course, if they are, yes, but then you have to have a host. You have to have a host, otherwise you can't just walk up somewhere and say, I'm here in the country, would you like a PDC? It won't work for bureaucracy. Also, in many places, the key thing about people is your relationship. So if you have no relationship, you haven't got a chance of getting in or getting anything done. I remember once when business people started going to Vietnam and wanted to set up banks or set up companies or, and they had terrible difficulties. I said, why is this? And they said, they haven't got any relationship with us. So everything is relationship. It, it's sort of understanding someone and knowing them, introducing them, and you can be completely locked out without it. Now that relationship is that they are responsible for you and take you through. Um, Charlie, generally, basic needs are paramount. You're talking about food, water, shelter, health, more or less that order simultaneously in most places that have either had civil war or war or huge pandemics like AIDS in Africa, where there were... You know, at one stage, orphanages were a measure 
of the poverty of the country or the war or the pandemics. And you just find orphanage after orphanage after orphanage. So they were in need and that's where you'd start work with the orphanages in East Timor and Uganda and stuff like that. And then how much of the permaculture content did you, did you manage to, to cover, if, if any? Pretty much all of it, but you don't teach the same way. Right. You teach quite differently. So if you're teaching something, you're just looking around for stuff and you might have an interpreter and you grab almost anything, it doesn't matter. And you say, okay, we're talking about the farm, you know, let's talk about the farm. And you're generally on the floor very often, so what have we got? Chalk, piece of land, where's the sun come up? Everyone draw the sun, where's the sun go down, draw the sun. Okay, have you got a house? All right, let's have a look at your house. All right. All right. Is that a house? Everyone says yes. Or something. Is that your tent? Is that your container? Right, and you put it together and then talk about getting water and then you talk about the chicken and you might just have a drawing of a chicken. Where will we put the chicken? Where will we put the fence? Where is the pond going to go? This is the pond. Where would you put that? So you're making everything as tangible and visible as you possibly can all the time or you're outside referring, look over there. What's that point called when the hill goes like that? Look over there and point to that point and then they point to that point, we talk about key point. So it's ability to use your environment and use anything in sight at any time. Okay, so we've got a big river along here. What's the water like in the river? It's all pretty dirty, isn't it? Why is it dirty? Oh, we've got these farms here and they're now all using pesticide, huh? So what can you do about that? People come up with solutions, but when you provide a picture, they will read in, I'd say, farm, 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 river. That's accepted, they'll solve the pressure. No one will say that's a scarf and that's just a sign. They will accept what you say it is and then they'll run with it. You can't do better than using things. The other thing is use your role plays. So how many ways can we get water into soil? We've got a slope coming down here. Can we have a few people up there, please? Yeah, a few people. We've got a slope coming down here. Now, what ways have we got? Of, we want some water. We'll have some water, please, rolling down the hill. Thanks, Greta. Yep. OK, so the water's trying to get down here very fast. Right, what have we got here? There's the water. How are we going to stop that water going downhill? What, what can we do? A log. A log. Very good. <laughs> OK. All right. Let's, no, let's have the log back here. What else can we do? A log is excellent. What else can we do? Just this water. Water's back here. Water's back here. I'd better if you stay on your legs because we're going to spread and have you go around as well. A dam. Water. OK, here comes the water. It's coming fast. Now what happens? <laughs> oh, but that, now a pond. Oh, what happens to the water? Some of it, some of it's going to stay, isn't it? Now let's have something else to save the water. Here, what else have we got? How else can we hold water in the land? Right? right, we'll have some trees. And what else can we do? Right, we've got, we can have swales, we can have canals, we can have gabions, we can have trees, we can have ponds. See, a little bit of water. So, thank you. You can do it with a windbreak. Let's have a windbreak. Let's have a single row of trees across here. Just a single row of trees. Come on, trees. Right. Let's have, let's have two lots of wind over here that want to get through and desiccate and dry the water. Come on. Right. Yep, good. Oh, God, let's have some more. Let's have some more windbreak. Let's... Let's have some lower species, lower species, leaf to the ground, right? All leaf to the ground, very hard. Okay, right. right. We've now got a, yeah, we've got a two, we've got a two, 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 row, two row wind break now, leaf to the ground so the wind can't get under. What's the wind going to do? Or... <laughs> Okay, thank you. As fast as you can think, 
you can do and people will remember. So if you wanted six ways of getting water into soil or slowing it down, you just name them first. We want to rip it, we want to do gabions, we want to do vetiver, we want to do this, and then people just fall into place and do it. And in the end, the water's all used up. So you can do that with lots and lots of things. It just depends how quickly you can think. But the human body is marvellous. You know, you can use it for trees and condensation, you can use it for lots of things. People will take on what you ask them to do very quickly. Ah, five minutes. Time for questions. Five minutes. I'm counting down. Sorry, did you have an actual... I think you already said no, I didn't look at customs, but did you always have a connection? You said you had an invitation. I remember when you asked the question. You had an invitation to come to certain countries to teach... So then when you arrived, did you immediately have that cultural connection as a person who said, now yeah, don't look the men in the eye, or don't stand here, or don't show your soul to be fed? So did you have a lead into specific things that you had to make sure you complied with so you stay on? I can't remember how I picked up those details. I mean, in Islamic country, everyone, men and women, cover their genitals to here. The men have got the long shirts, the women are dressed as black crows. Um, in other places, you actually can't sit cross-legged like this. In Cambodia, you sit like this, women sit like that. It is so insulting to sit like that. So I don't know how you learn that, but it's a, people will be preoccupied if, they, if you've got your feet out like that. that mm, it's to do with Buddhism and what comes from Buddha's feet and Buddha's head and stuff like that. And all that sort of thing, yeah. That only discredits you slightly. The most important thing is how you get your message across. Normally, I just wait. But I do a three-day example of what permaculture can deliver. So I've got a quite a good packed short course. And if I were going to the Department of Women's Affairs nationally, as several countries have, then I'd offer those women managers a three-day course if they like it, they say, we'd like you to go to this province and teach. And then we teach there. And then they make the course their own. I cannot teach at village level at all well because I haven't been through the experience of that extreme trauma. I haven't been through the experience of their lives. And the district level, so you have to know your political levels, the district level is the one that's most effective. And then you're providing in-service training to agriculture advisors, both women and men, and often NGO counterparts. But yes, I'm always invited in. I wouldn't know where to start, and, and I wouldn't get permission anyway. Mm. It's, um, and the whole fraught thing of visas is just another thing altogether. Um, and also, from the culture for refugees, what, has, what is the most effective is working with and a local organisation, people who know the language, know the country, are already working in an area, are going to be there long after you're gone. And so the most successful permaculture for refugees courses is where there's an organisation that has invited you to be there, you've facilitated a course, preferably done a teacher training directly after, or what we're moving to now, which is where there's people who have permaculture knowledge we can run a teacher training with them and then teach a PVC with their trainers after the teacher training. So that we don't have to go back and we shouldn't have to go back because writing your own redundancy into the plan is really important so that there's not a dependence on people who look like Fro or me or any of us in the room, but actually that their trainers have been supported to, to be that person. Um, uh, they do change it. I've seen someone say, show me this garden, tell me about it, because I do a lot of monitoring. And they say, well, this is a square mandala garden. I say, mm-hmm, good. But, you know, I hadn't really heard of a square mandala garden, but there was one. And that was fine, wasn't it? Who, who cares? What, what, what have been some of the most successful projects that we've seen carry on? Um, I think Vietnam and Cambodia. The FAO picked up. Most of the course and teacher training trained their staff and counterparts who are local people in and taught right through the country, made a major impact on food supplies at that time. And in Cambodia, the trainers that we trained then went to other 
provinces. And I get feedback every now and again about people saying that's still being taught and that's still being used. So, yes, the thing that's been so damaging have been industrial chemicals have been absolutely shocking at taking apart what was a growing and good system for the people in many ways. Mm. But since mm? the time that you've been active in those countries? Well, you see, I started off as a development worker in Lesotho before you were born, uh, which was about 1974, 75, 76, 77, all the time of Soweto riots, and I was an agricultural scientist then, which I repent want to be forgiven and um, it's good basic knowledge but it's not useful knowledge it's not relevant where people are hungry um, and then when I did permaculture I knew I had the right tool for circumstances where people were hungry and that's what made a difference was having something that could, was malleable to be used local all the local techniques could come in and be used and you're just giving them the principles it's a bit like what's happening in the course we're presiding the guidance you carry out the work and make it your own. But we're not dictating to you what you'll teach at every step of the way or anything. It's that freedom to, to really make it your own and become your own person. Mm -hmm. um, we've got lots of, um, of religions in these cultures and they're not always the same religion. There's multiple religions in singular <coughs> countries. And I was just wondering how the translation of ethics comes in do people find it affronting that we're trying to bring something to them that's a cultural foundation for something else? That's not a problem because one thing in a PDC, we don't allow any religion. So when someone says, can we start the day with prayers, we say, yes, but it has to be before the 8.30 gathering or the 8 o'clock gathering or at the end of the day. So it's entirely voluntary and it's not seen as something. Anyway, if you're working for the Australian government, you'd be out quick smart if you started to push religion. You're not allowed to do it in any development project ever. Um, but then the contrary is someone coming and saying, can we do some Islamic thing here? And I say, well, before eight o'clock or after five, because it's not in the curriculum, because we cannot afford that bias and we're not altogether sure of what's being taught or the implications of it. But if we're at a place and they're singing the call to prayer at 11, if they want to, we stop for 10 minutes. On Friday, if people want to go to the mosque, they go to the mosque and come back. All that is completely what they tell us they want. It's not what we decide. Do you want to stop? Do you not? And, you know, weekend's Friday, Saturday. It's not Saturday, Sunday. Monday's a working day. Well, on different public holidays. And the ones I don't like are really the holidays where... You're in bare feet walking round and round the pagoda with a tray on your head with cigarettes and tins of fish for the monks for two hours. You know, the romance goes right off. They say, come to the ceremony. You think, how lovely. Lovely <laughs> Buddhist ceremony. And now, lady, you're holding this plastic tray with gold leaf round and round in bare feet in the mud. A lot of it isn't nearly as exciting as the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> At all. It's quite difficult. Um, but when in doubt, just stand back and be told. You will sit here, you go there. Some of the most difficult things are food. In Afghanistan, I did stop at eating cooked goat's eyeballs because I don't know what was wrong with me. I just looked at this eyeball on my plate. And I don't think I can do this. So I give it to a little child who needs protein or something. who go, boom, gone. Mm? <laughs> And another one was actually, in Asia, you take a duck egg and you let it develop the stage where the duck has got a few feathers and little feet and then you crack it and eat it just before it hatches. And I got given one of those. I had a very good relationship with this interpreter over the years, Jia, who's absolutely lovely. I said, Jia, can you... And while no one's watching, I switch a dish. And then they gave me another one. <laughs> And he ate four of those ducklings. <laughs> oh, I just think, what a hero. Mm? And you know, there's things like if you finish your food too soon, it'll get piled up this big and you must empty your plate. The first time I left a bit, they said, don't you know someone has weeded and transplanted and grown 
and harvested and weeded this food and you're leaving it on your plate. You must never leave food on your plate. So I ate up all my food and then this much again. So just watching others and managing to be last and you learn from observation a lot too. Quite often in a meeting you're working out who's got the power, who's got the money, who's got the history, who's got the expertise, who, do, who needs to know this and make the decisions and that can be quite hard. But you know, there's lots of stuff. One night we stopped at a roadhouse and it's actually a brothel and the, the truck drivers with their one-eyed trucks after the war, you know, and three wheels, bashing on the door at night and crashing round the place and, you know, it's all, all a bit wild and out west sometimes and you're feeling your way with great vigilance for what should... And you're very often sick and you override, override. It's no good saying, I'm not very well or I don't feel like this or I haven't had my massage or I'm not doing self-care because there is no self-care. You just keep moving through. So you can have news, someone's died at home, go in there and say, good morning, everyone, lovely to see you again. It's really great you're here. You don't emotionally exploit people with your problems. You, you take them away and deal with them separately. It can be very lonely. If you're on your own, you want to discuss something you're worried about. It might be corruption in the project, not being delivered, things happening, and you can walk the floor not knowing what to do or where to go about something. Um, and you see things you don't like, children being trafficked, children being trafficked for body parts, stuff that you would rather not know about, I think. Um, so all of it teaching in other cultures is about standing back, trying to be aware, keeping an eye on things and just doing whatever you can do. You often feel you're on a tightrope between delivering anything worthwhile and... Um, what you'd like to be doing. I usually leave disappointed, thinking they deserve something better than this, but that's the best under the circumstance. Mm. And the results have been stunning, actually. And I think it's been because we've had local NGOs and local people in all the courses where we can. So when COVID struck, the local inhabitants in those courses looked after the refugee permaculturalists. And when COVID struck, they took food when others pulled out. So having that particular combination when you can was all important. Anyway, eight o'clock. Oh, it's not. It's eight minutes past. That's it. That's your lot. Right. <laughs> talk to me. Talk to me privately sometime about other things. I'm really happy to talk about but I'm not going to keep you now. You're preoccupied. You have things to do. Okay. But it's a great life. It doesn't always make you happy, but it has lots of meaning. Mainly a lot of anxiety, which doesn't do you any harm.